afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Durian, and uh, uh, the, with Jefferson County, and I'm the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the November 14, 2022, Dr. Cog TAC meeting. This hybrid meeting, uh, meet, uh, members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. Make sure that, I'm sorry, uh, just to, uh, during public comment anyway, make sure that uh, your type name reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Uh, just as a reminder, we have uh, members here in person who are members of the TAC, and during agenda items, regular business agenda items, uh, we limit the conversation and questions to TAC members only, uh, although the public is welcome to comment under public comment, which is the second item on the agenda. Uh, at this time, members attending in person will introduce themselves. If for some reason you don't hear your name, please uh, let Cam know, and we will uh, add you to the record. Why don't we start, uh, we'll start at this end at the table and go around. Uh, senior Special Agency. David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Greenwald, uh, City of Longmont. Basket, City of Westminster, Jefferson County Representative. Sarah Grant, uh, City and County of Brimfield. In Sanson, City of Boulder. Mike Whitaker, City of Lake, FCO alternate. David Spados, Regional Air Quality Council. Uh, Carson Priest, TDM non motorized seat. Uh, Jeff Dankenbring, representing Arapahoe County from City of Centennial. Matt Callison, uh, City of Aurora, Repo County Alternate. Thank you. Frank Bruno, via Mobility Services. Thank you. All right. Uh... Bill Soroy, uh, RTD. Rick Pilgrim, Environmental Interests. That's Chemical Bust, CDOT, Region 1. Jim Houston, CDOT Region 4, Greeley. Uh, Marissa Gahan, CDOT Division of Transportation. Art Griffith. Justin, Justin Schmidt, representing Douglas. Justin, Justin Bagley, City County, Denver. Corey McDonald, Dr. Cobb. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, Next, uh, do we have any new members to introduce, Jacob? Sound check. Okay. Uh, two alternates, uh, changes to announce. First, welcome back to Gene Sanson, alternate for City of Boulder. Um, and then new alternate for City of Denver, Kurt Upton. All right. Thank you very much. Just want to let everybody know we will have one item, I guess, probably under administrative items at the end to discuss in addition to what's shown in your agenda. So stay tuned for that. Um, with that, uh, next we have um, public comment. I think we have at least one person here for public comment. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, my name is my Nancy, name is Nancy York. York. I am I with am Jefferson, Jefferson County, County Open Space. Open Space. And, and I just wanted I just to take just a few minutes of your time, time this afternoon, this afternoon to um, uh, speak to you speak about, to you one, about of one of the projects that is, that is recommended, recommended for, funding. for funding. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's a little, a little echoey. echoey. <laughs> better? How's this? How's this? Better? better? Much better. Much better. Um, um, so, so the Peaks to Plains Trail, Trail is, one, is of one, one of the projects that's recommended, that's recommended for, funding for funding in call free, call free of the Transportation, of the transportation Improvement, Improvement Program. Program. And, and I just wanted, I just to, wanted share to share with you um, a little, um, bit, a little about bit about the vision, the vision that, we that we have for this project, this project and why, and we, why believe we believe it's um, um, a regional, regional and statewide, statewide significance. significance. Um, the Peaks to Plains Trail 
65 mile corridor, mile corridor passes, passes through, through four counties, four counties seven, seven cities, cities through Denver, through Denver Metro. Metro. It has, it an, has elevation an elevation drop, drop of, of one mile, one mile from, from the Continental, Continental Divide, Divide at Loveland, Loveland Pass, Pass all the way, all the way down, down through the through metro, the metro area, area to the confluence of the South, South Pike Greenway. Greenway. And, and um, in, in 2016, 2016 then Governor, then Governor Hickenlooper, Hickenlooper um, um, identified, identified and, um, and deemed, and deemed the, the Plains Trail, Trail 116 of, of the highest of the priority trail projects, projects across, across the state, state, state in a pool, in a pool of, incredibly of incredibly special, special um, um, projects, projects, about 200, about 200 of them. Of them. And, and um, that, number that number 200, 200 is significant, is significant to me as well because, because it's feasible, it's feasible to, travel to travel from, from someone, could, someone fly could fly into Denver International, Denver International Airport, Airport, hop on their, hop bike, on their bike, and travel, and travel a full 200, 200 miles, miles um, on, on the Peaks, on the Peaks Plains, Plains Trail, Trail through some of Colorado's, Colorado's absolute, absolute choices choice landscapes, landscape, out to out Glenwood, to Glenwood Springs, Springs to dip their to toes, dip their in, toes the in the hot springs. Spring. Um, um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty special, special trail, trail, we believe, and very exciting is the scope that we're putting forward. In this, in, this, um, um, in this call, in this call is, is the closure, the closure of, a five of a five mile gap, gap in the heart in the of Cliff Canyon, Canyon along, along US, US Highway 6. 6. And we believe, and we believe that, that it's very important, important in that, in that um, it's, um, also it's also serving, serving as, as the only, only multimodal, multimodal access, access on Highway, on highway 6, 6 through Cliff Creek Canyon. Canyon. And that's, and because, that's because, of, because of many of you have many traveled, traveled, traveled the narrow the tunnels. Narrow tunnel and the blind, and the blind curve, curve um, through, um, the through the canyon. And so, and so the Peaks of Plains Peaks Trail, Trail is, is the answer, the answer in, that in that respect. And, and the scope, the scope of, work of work and the funding, and the funding that, we that we would receive would go would toward, of course, of course, all of the, all of the critical, critical environmental, environmental permitting design, design work that, um, that um, have, to, have preface to preface the construction, the construction of a very complex, complex five-mile five stretch that has 10 bridges and two trailheads for some of those precious parking spaces in the canyon. Um, um, and lastly, and last I just want to share, share my favorite, my favorite part, of part of the project, the project pick. But if I had, if I had to, to, it would be, it would be um, the, um, fact the fact that it's ADA compliant. ADA compliant. And, and um, um, I think that I is think just that is stunning when you, think, when you about think about the complexity, the complexity of, of a 10 foot concrete, concrete, concrete trail, trail through rugged, rugged super, super steep, steep Clear Creek Canyon, Canyon with the raging, with the raging creek, creek next to it. It's for everyone. And I think that makes it incredibly special. So I just wanted to share that vision on the regional statewide. And thank you all for your time. Is there anyone else who would like to speak uh, uh, on behalf of the public, either virtually, if you would like to raise your hand, or if there's anyone here in person? Not seeing anyone, so we will close public comment. Uh, next, we will um, uh, look at the TAC meeting summary for September 19th, 2022. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the September 19th TAC meeting summary? Seeing none, we'll call those approved. Next, we have two action items. The first action item is the uh, fiscal year 2022 through 2025 Transportation Improvement Program Policy Amendments. Todd Cottrell. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. So, so uh, uh, this afternoon, this afternoon uh, we present, we present 10, amendments 10 amendments to the current, to the current 2022 to 2025. Um, and, um, and from staff's from perspective, perspective uh, uh, we are changing, we are changing things, things up slightly, slightly from what we have done we have in the past. past. Um, we, are um, we are providing additional, additional information, information within, within this cover this memo, cover memo um, to, um, to sort of portray what is, what is truly, truly going on, on. How, much how, much is, is, how much money is how much new funding is going, is going into, the into the tip versus, versus how much is being just transferred from project to project. project. So, for so example, for example, if you look at the first line, line US 6 US and Wadsworth, Wadsworth um, it is um, adding $60 million, 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 million dollars, um, in state legislative funding, but we are also adding $5 million to faster safety from the region faster pool. And if we skip, and we skip down, down a couple, a couple lines, lines to the Region, uh, region 1 faster pool, pool, you can see, you can where, see it, where it does indicate, does indicate that, that it is removing $5 million dollars faster, faster funds, funds in transferring, transferring that to the that US 6 Wadsworth project. project. 
Um, so again, um, so again, from my staff, from my staff perspective, perspective, I think from this, from point, this point forward, forward um, we're not, we're not going to plan, plan on going each individual, individual amendment, amendment um, unless, unless there happens to only be two or three or, or, or a short, short number. number. But, if, but especially, especially if we get to an extensive, extensive list, list um, 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 I think this, I think this is, is probably the probably preferred, preferred way from our perspective, perspective to, to portray this from now, from now um, going forward. forward. Um, it is um, possible, it is possible depending, depending on the type, on the type of, project of project and the project actual change, change taking place, place. We, we may end up adding, adding, a, adding column a column or two, or two to this, to this um, um, table. table. Um, so again, just, again, just pray, pray more information, more information for your benefit, for your benefit um, if you have any you questions. Have any questions. So, so, um, with um, that, with that we, have we have five amendments, five amendments that are listed on this first page. page. Following, following up with up five additional, additional amendments, amendments that are provided on the, the second page. Second page. Um, and happy to take any questions or comments you may have. Otherwise, otherwise, the motion, motion that there is on your screen, your screen. Uh, to recommend uh, to, to the Regional, Regional Transportation Committee the attached project, project amendments, amendments to the 22-25 Transportation Improvement Program. All right, thank you, Todd. Does anyone have any questions for Todd? Hands raised. Uh, do we have anyone who'd like to make a motion? Matt Art? I'd like to make a motion. Staff recommendation. All right. Do we have a second? No. Oh. A second? No. Oh. All right. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Do one oppose, please state no. Opposition. All right, so it's an animus. Um, approval for this motion. Thank you very much, Todd. Next item on our agenda is item number five, trans uh, 2022 to 2027 Transportation Improvement Program call number three. Uh, recommendations um, for, the, uh, for the TIP regional share. Todd Cottrell. You're up again. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You, so, so as I've as started, I've out, started with out with calls call one, and, one two, and two, we'll start out with start a very, out similar, very similar side, side for the beginning of slide three, or call three, call three um, just um, to make just sure to make everyone is up to speed and exactly, exactly where, where we are in this, in this very long, very long process, process, longer than longer usual. Than usual. Um, um, so over, so over uh, from 2022 to 2027, it was $466.4 million Federal and state, state funds, funds to allocate. allocate. Um, we have um, we conducted have that over that four calls, calls, in which we are nearing the nearing completion of the, of the third call. call. The first two the first calls were for air quality and multimodal, and multimodal projects, projects only, only. Um, and, those um, and those were, were in September, in September uh, amended, amended into the current 22 to 25, 25 tip. tip. We are now, we, are now, uh, we have concluded, uh, we have concluded our, in our in final process, process for call three, $49.2 million. million. Um, um, calls call three and three four, and four. The, projects the projects are for, are for two, different two different tracks, tracks one for one air quality, quality multimodal, multimodal, multimodal projects, projects, and another, and another track, track for surface for transportation, transportation block, block grant projects. projects. Both, Both results, results of calls, calls three and four, and four um, will, will go into the development of a brand new tip covering FY 24 to 27. So a little bit so more, about more about call three, three those details. Those details. Um, this um, is an eight-week eight call that was open from August 22nd to October, October 11th. 11th. Um, as um, I mentioned, as I mentioned there two there tracks two available. available. So again, this is uh, uh, different, different from calls from one and two. two. Um, um, as, as typical, typical and, and as outlined, outlined in the first two first calls two and outlined in the policy, um, a regional, a regional share, share call, each form, form is allowed to allowed submit up to three applications, applications and CDOT and, CDOT and RTD, RTD were allowed, allowed to submit up to up two to each. each. Um, the bottom, the bottom table, table outlines the total funding, total funding that was available, available in addition, in addition to, to the year breakdown, year breakdown and the funding. funding. So these, so these after the call closed, closed uh, Dr. Cox, Dr. Cox, Dr. Cox staff took the time to post, to post these, 19 these 19 applications, applications along with any supplemental information that was received. received. Uh, and then uh, a dozen, then a dozen Dr. Cox staff, staff scored, scored each question, each, question of each application, each application um, from, um, from a score of zero, zero to five, five, five being, being the highest. highest. And, and as an as outcome of that, there was a weighted average score for each application that was developed. Um, as, um, as started, started in, in calls, calls one and one two, and we have two. continued, continued with, with um, um, opening, opening up a public, public comment, comment period, period for approximately for two to three weeks after each call. call. From that, From we that, have received we have over 1,200 1, public, public comments, comments on these 19, on these 19 applications. applications. And that that process, process was opened open from October 12th, 12th to October 26th. 26th. We also we conducted, conducted this via a web, a web map, as map as we did with the first two calls. 
Um, you were all, um, you were all, the public, the was, public also was also available, available to, to enter, enter um, either, um, by, either phone by phone or, or email. email. Um, um, a comment, a comment is, is a physical, a physical comment, comment on, on the actual, the actual project, project itself, itself or, or a comment could comment be could that be they indicated support or concern, concern or were in or opposition, opposition to that, to that one, one individual project. project. Based on, Based those, on scores those scores from Dr. From Dr. Staff, Staff and the public, and public comments, comments, that information, that information was turned over to a project, to a project review panel, panel um, that, met that met twice, twice the first week, week of, of or the, or the last week of October. Week of October. Um, um, they, received, they received, again, like, again, like, like, I, said, like I said, both the both scores the and the comments. comments. Um, um, and they were, they were, they had, they had the, the, um, the task, the task of, developing of developing a recommendation, recommendation for each track, track in the overall, in the overall wait, list. wait The project, the project review, review panel was made up from one technical, one technical representative, representative from each from of each the eight, eight sub-regional sub forums, forums. Um, one um, member, one member each from CDOT and, and RTD, RTD, in addition, in addition to three subject, subject matter experts. experts. So, so in terms of the terms recommendations, of the recommendations um, first, um, we'll first we'll go through, we'll go the, through the air quality, quality and multimodal track. Um, the, um, the panel, the is, panel recommending is recommending to fund four projects, four projects. Um, and these, um, and these are, are indicated here in the gray, gray um, column, column with the with red the text. Red text. Um, the first the three projects, projects from their recommendation, from their recommendation. Um, it was for um, the was full, for full funding, funding amount. amount. The fourth the project, project from, from Denver on the South Platte Trail Improvements. The recommendation, the recommendation was to fund only 8.5 of $9 million dollar request. request. Um, in um, discussions, in discussions with Denver, with Denver they would they be, would able, be to, able to uh, fund, uh, the, fund entire the entire scope, scope that was submitted. submitted. I'm going to head back to uh, cover the regional, regional share and then head back to the regional share wait list. Wait. For, for the STBG track, track, again, four, four projects, projects were also recommended from that track. Uh, going, down going down them down a little bit more in detail for the federal, the federal BRT, BRT project, project that was submitted by CDOT, by CDOT. Um, only um, fifteen million dollars, fifteen million, million, dollars, $2 million $2 fifty one thousand dollars was recommended on the twenty million, million dollar request. request. And again, and again, in conversations, in conversations with CDOT, with CDOT um, they were um, they were uh, they'd be um, able, they'd able to fund the fund entire scope as submitted. submitted. For the, for the uh, uh, State uh, Highway 119 in Niwot, submitted um, through, through the Boulder, Boulder Forum, Boulder, Boulder County Boulder being the sponsor, sponsor. Um, the panel the recommended panel recommend $6 million over $16.1 million, $16 million, million request. Dollars. Um, and, they and they said that they, said that they indicated, indicated they would be able to fund the Q bypass lanes, 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 the BRT platforms, platforms and the intersection, intersection improvements only. only. Um, um, skipping, skipping the Kingston Plains just for a second, for a second. Uh, the, panel the panel did recommend did fully funding the Peoria Bridge, Bridge replacement um, submitted, submitted through the Adams County, County Forum by Aurora. By Aurora. Um, and finally, um, and finally the, remaining the remaining funds, funds in the STG track would go to the Peak to Peaks Plains, Plains Trail submitted trail by Jefferson, Jefferson County. County. In addition, in addition the, remaining the remaining $5.1 million dollars from the air quality, quality multi track, track would also, would be, also carried be carried over into this into track, track for a full for funding, funding cost of $10 million, $10 million half, half of the original, of the original submitted, submitted request. request. Going back Going just back for just a second, for a second on, the on the regional share wait, wait list, list. Um, the, recommendation the recommendation from the panel, panel was to um, fund, fund these projects, projects initially, initially in score in order. order. However, However the, the project, project review, review panel, panel did indicate, indicate they would like they would to like reconvene like at the conclusion, conclusion of call four um, to um, potentially, potentially reorder, reorder that wait, that wait list, list um, based um, on um, disproportionately impacted environmental justice, justice population, population groups, groups um, um, and, ge and ge geographic, geographic uh, diversity, diversity in addition, in addition to scores that were also that were received. Also With that, With that uh, we're uh, near conclusion, but I did want to cover, just cover quickly what those what next steps, steps are, are um, as, we, as sort we sort of move out of, out of call three. Call, three. Um, call um, four will open, open in two weeks on November 28th, 28th and include at the end of January. Um, at that time, after that call closes, um, um, the information, the information will be um, passed pass along, along to each individual, individual forum. forum. Um, that, individual um, that individual forum will forum score and go and through, through the recommendation, recommendation process, process in the months of February through April. April. Um, Dr. Dr. Cox staff will then um, go through um, go a draft, draft 24 to 27, 27 tip, tip, including with including a public, with a public hearing, hearing in, July, in July, and then we'll be looking we'll for tip adoption, adoption in, August. in August. So I'd be so happy to take any comments, comments or questions you have. You have. Um, um, we do have we do several, have several mem members of the panel, panel so, I may, so I may ask them, them, to, them to answer a question if one is asked. Ask. Otherwise, Otherwise, the motion before you will be to, will move, be to move to recommend to the Regional, regional Transportation, Transportation Committee allocating, allocating regional, regional share funds share to funds eight, eight projects, projects to be included, included within the new 24 to 27 Transportation Improvement Program. Thank you, Todd. Would anyone like to, uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Deborah. I just wanted to add one thing that you didn't mention the wait list 
this at the wait list after we go through call four as we anticipate a number of the projects that weren't funded in call three will apply for call four. So then we'll have a subset left that we can look at in terms of geographic equity and other factors to have the best wait list possible. Questions or comments for Todd? Seeing any, uh, would anyone like to make a motion? I would like to make a motion, uh, move to recommend the Regional Transportation Committee allocating the regional share funds to the eight projects selected and presented today to be included in the new fiscal year 2024 to 2027 transportation improvement program. A second. I would like to second that motion. All right. Uh, so anyone in favor of this? Or first of all, is there any other further discussion on this motion before we move on to a vote? Okay, not seeing any hands. So let's go ahead and uh, anyone in favor of the motion, please state uh, so by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed, please say no. This is unanimously. Thank you. All right, so the uh, next item is an informational item, uh, item number six on your agenda, which is the corridor planning program and community-based transportation plans. Uh, Nora Kern. Thanks, Steve. Actually, Jacob Rieger, I'm going to handle this item. We're aware of some sound issues for those who are uh, listening in online, so uh, something, something about the podium. So I'm going to try doing it from here, um, see if the sound quality will be better for folks um, participating online. Um, but on Nora's behalf, I uh, did want to talk about two new programs that we're starting up at Dr. Cog. One is a corridor planning program, and the other is a community-based transportation planning program. These are both pilot programs. So I wanted to give you some initial information on um, how these are starting to evolve. Thank you, Kaylee. So let's start with the corridor planning program. Really the big idea here, um, as we all know, we worked for two years together, shoulder to shoulder to develop and adopt the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. And then we spent nine months revising that plan uh, to meet the state greenhouse gas planning standard. We've made some very specific commitments in the Regional Transportation Plan in terms of what we call project and program investment priorities. So one of the things we've been thinking of as Dr. Cog's staff is how to bring the plan to life. We all do that together. You do that in your work. We do that in our work, um, but we wanted to be even more intentional about taking the lead um, on actually some corridor studies for some of the major investments, projects, and corridors in the plan directly that Dr. Cog would actually lead um, some what we call first step corridor studying. So these would be like initial visioning planning type studies, not to the PEL or NEPA level, but kind of getting some of these corridors starting. So. Um, so I think I've covered most of what's on this slide, but really identify, well, sorry, Kayla, go back just to make sure I covered everything, uh, but really identifying the multimodal investments that can be advanced towards implementation, helping the region advance the goals, again, that are in the 2050 RTP. And the other component of this is that we're all doing great work collectively, local governments, Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, others, um, helping ourselves, frankly, and the region kind of understand what are the, what is the status of, of each of these corridors. We've been working on an interactive map, which I'll show you a static version um, as part of this as well. Go ahead, Kaylee. Thank you. So in the corridor selection, we put out a solicitation in the beginning of October through the month of October. We identified some overarching priorities for the beginning of this pilot program. Um, obviously, local jurisdiction buy-in. The idea is that Dr. Cog, we would provide our planning support, and we have some planning funds to contribute towards this. We want local governments to provide your in-kind staff support, your commitment to work with us. Um, regional impact, of course, is always important of these corridors. Obviously, inclusion in the plan and a little bit of readiness and the staging period in which these corridors or investments are located within the plan. We also identified some priorities um, as part of this, along with the overarching priorities. One is advancing equity, that's certainly important. Building out the regional transit network, addressing safety concerns as outlined in our regional vision zero plan and our high injury network, um, and expanding multimodal transportation. Most of the corridors in the 2050 RTP are in fact multimodal corridors in one way or another, and we wanted to recognize that through this work. Go ahead, Kaylee. 
So, so in terms of corridor selection, um, as I said, we put out a solicitation. Uh, we have many corridors that are eligible, even if we didn't call them corridors per se in the plan. Some corridors we did identify specifically. Others were really about the investments with the major projects on those corridors that are in the fiscally constrained RTP. We asked for um, a call for letter. We solicited, I should say. Um, we asked for letters of interest. We sent that solicitation out on October 1st. Um, those were due on the 31st. Uh, we did receive four letters of interest, and our selection panel is actually going to meet um, this week to kind of work through those and see if we can get to a selection um, of our first kind of pilot corridor. Go ahead to the next slide, Kaylee. And then I mentioned that map. This is a, sort of a prototype. This is a work in progress. It's obviously a static version, um, but we are working on an interactive GIS map that really takes together all of the planning, visioning, PEL, NEPA, other studies that we're all working on across this region and trying to map those out. And again, really help both ourselves as stakeholders and the public kind of understand what's happening on federal, what's happening on Colfax, what's happening on our freeways, what's the status of, of planning and, and corridor and implementation on these corridors. So we think this will be a really useful resource for the region once this is complete. So that's the corridor planning program. Maybe let me pause for a second there before I go into the next one, see if there's any questions or thoughts on that. Yes. Jacob, thanks for that uh, presentation, part of it. Um, do you have the four corridors that you got letters for? Um, sure. Um, let's see if I remember all four from memory. One was South Boulder Road, um, one was 38th Avenue in Denver and Wheat Ridge, I believe. One was the Spear Corridor in Denver, and the other was up in lines of the St. Brain Greenway. I think I have that right. Those were the four that we received and that our selection panel is working through. We are, just to be transparent, this is a pilot program. We're just we're trying this out. We're going to see how it goes. Our intention is to do a couple corridors. So for this first corridor, this is one that we sort of put out publicly. Uh, we asked all of you as jurisdictions to submit LOIs, as I said. So we're going to pick one corridor from that pool. And then the second corridor is probably going to be a Dr. Cox staff-initiated corridor, again, reflecting on the priorities and the commitments from the RTP. That one we're still kind of working through. Um, but we're going to do two corridors together or close together to see what we can learn from both of those as a pilot program before we institutionalize this um, as part of the next transportation improvement program. So, I apologize if I'm confused. I'm, I'm, I'm that we advance the gas, gas program. All those corridors have some action. Yeah, that's a good question. So Deborah's question was, what about the BRT corridors that we advanced during the greenhouse gas planning work? We made a commitment that we would advance five or implement five BRT corridors by 2030. We have been working sort of as part of this program and sort of separately uh, with stakeholders to kind of understand um, the status of each of those corridors and think about, um, you know, who takes the lead, what are the planning efforts, how do we get those done by 2030? So the short answer, Deborah, I could give a long answer. The short answer is yes. They're accounted for in some way through stakeholder coordination. So we're kind of viewing them as separate um, from this program, but they're definitely spoken for in one sense, one way, shape or form to keep them going. So in the 2050 RP, RT, several corridors that you identified funding did some some dollar amount about identifying specific. How do those fit into this program, and do they take a priority in terms of consideration, given the fact that you wanted to identify what improvement necessary be? funding of projects. Yeah, also a good question, Brian. So, correct, we did identify multiple corridors in the plan, both on the highway side and the transit side. We had kind of highway planning corridors and transit planning corridors within the RTP. Those corridors are not universally situated. They're not uniformly situated, I should say. Some corridors are just kind of concepts at this point. Not a lot has been done. Some of those corridors might, you know, might be eligible for an iteration of this program. Some corridors, I'll just pick on one, in State Highway 7, for example, where there's been a lot of planning, or even Santa Fe on the highway side, where there has been um, 
a lot of planning, maybe an EL study, something that's been done on those corridors. In that case, our commitment in the RTP stands to work with those stakeholders where they're at or where we're at together in that process and to work with those stakeholders to advance those corridors to the next step. In the corridor planning program, however, we're looking for corridors that are really just at the very beginning. There hasn't been a lot of attention, hasn't been a lot of resources available, want to get those started. So if you think of a Venn diagram, there is some overlap between those two, but not universally. So some could be eligible, some are at different points in their process. Does that make sense? If I could just that a little bit. So keep in mind, this is this is our first two quarter planning efforts. We're using uh, federal planning funds that we receive an MP as an MPO. But also remember that the board has allocated and created a tip set aside program for fiscal years 24 through 27 as uh, uh, of the tip. So when when the board finally adopts the final tip, we have that new set aside program that we will continue for an additional four years funding for additional quarter. These first two are not the only two. These are the first two. Um, information. This is an exciting program. Sir, can you clarify for me uh, what we can expect in terms of next steps? I know that there you pilots forward in 2023, but will be selected first. Heather, can you just provide some clarification on that? Sure. Yeah, we want to get two corridors uh, going as a sort of pilot program, um, and we think they'll take, I don't know, nine months, 12 months, you know, we'll have to see exactly the time frame, but several months uh, for each of these corridors to kind of work through. Uh, we'll be hiring a consultant to kind of help us with this, so it's a combination of kind of staff, direct, Dr. Cog's staff uh, resources, um, planning funds, as Ron mentioned, um, consultant assistance from our end, and then, as I said at the beginning, local jurisdiction kind of staff in kind buy-in. We want to work in partnership uh, with the jurisdictions for the selected corridors. So again, let's say nine to 12 months um, to be refined, but probably about that uh, to get through the sort of uh, planning process for these first two corridors. Then we want to take a step back. You know, what did we learn uh, from these first two as a pilot and then work towards, as Ron said, institutionalizing this as part of the 24 to 27 tip. Does that answer your question, Jean? It does. Thanks. Um, and then a follow-up question. If we submitted one that wasn't selected for 2023, will we be re again or will that just stay on a list? It's a good question. I think the short answer would probably be it could be resubmitted and probably at that point as part of once we institutionalize it as part of the TIP uh, where we'll go through kind of that more formal selection process when we get past the phase of it being a pilot program. Um, so, in other words, if your court orb isn't picked this time, there will be future opportunities for sure. Any other questions on the corridor side? Okay. Um, let's talk about community-based transportation plans. It rolls right off the tongue. This one's a little bit different. The sort of thematic idea here is that we wanted to be intentional about how we work with some of our equity and vulnerable communities in this region. Um, so often they only hear from people when there's a project or there's an improvement or there's something that's going to happen directly in those communities. And we said, okay, look, what if we sort of step back from a particular project or investment? What if we just work with those communities on their own terms and just kind of help them with a the planning process to figure out kind of what they need within their own community. So I do want to go through these program goals. Um, it's important. Improving mobility options for low-income and historically disadvantaged communities within our Dr. Cog region. Identifying the needs of two focused communities uh, through creation of a community-based transportation plan by September of next year. Um, so again, about a year-long planning process. Identifying implementable projects or programs that could address needs of focused communities. Obviously, probably with a transportation benefit of course, but you know, when we get into a planning process, we want to hear from those communities. What do you need? Even if it's something that's not directly transportation, even if it's not directly something that's provided or funded by Dr. Cog, we want to meet them on their own terms without expectations and really listen and understand what would help those communities. Uh, developing new practices for engaging low-income and BIPOC communities and grassroots community-based organizations. That's a part of this I'll talk about in a minute. And building relationships with those grassroots organizations representing underserved populations in our Dr. Cog region. 
The next, thank you, Kaylee. Um, so what is a community-based transportation plan? Again, this is a pilot program, something we've never done before. We're starting out, taking some tentative steps, and we're learning and evolving as we go. But as we sit today, elements of the plan we think could include, obviously, community engagement, identification of transportation needs, challenges, and barriers in those communities, discussion of possible programs or projects to address those needs, and recommended strategies, actions, or next steps, something tangible that we can all walk away from and say, here's what's going to happen next. Focusing on low-income people in historically disadvantaged communities in our region and their specific transportation challenges. Um, so centering low-income people and people of color throughout the planning process, prioritizing equitable community engagement, and partnering with community-based nonprofit organizations in plan creation. And that's really important to us. We want to work with those communities directly, and we want to work with organizations, um, NGOs, nonprofits, others who work in those communities, local government staff, and others who understand those communities best. Next slide. So in terms of considerations for selecting kind of these first couple communities, um, obviously historically marginalized groups and disproportionately impacted communities in our region, jurisdiction buy-in, um, we've centered the solicitation around jurisdictions, local governments, local and county governments, community-based organization buy-in, planning need, and a potential for regional collaboration. The timeline here, so this one we um, released, again, a, a, a solicitation for letters of interest or letters of nomination at um, the beginning of November. This one we're giving a little bit of a longer lead time because we're looking potentially for partnerships between a local government, um, a nonprofit, a community organization, whatever that may be. Um, so the lead time here, these are not due until mid-December. And then as we get into January, we want to, uh, we'll have a panel uh, working through um, the submissions that we receive, the nominations, and working through to make a selection, and then um, as we get into next year, formation of a steering committee um, and kick off of the planning process. So I think that's all I had on that one. That, that one, you know, we're excited about both of these. This one's really different from anything we've done before, so we're excited to see where this goes. Um, but I'd be happy to answer questions on this one as well. Questions? Oh, go ahead, Deborah. Um, so much as anticipation that working with the non-government organizations are going to take some time back before you can really go. Um, I had one reach out to me and you think this means that something funded. So explain all that, but I just wanted to say it, it's in the process. We should anticipation going at the beginning. No, no, you're absolutely right. One question I'll answer that um, hasn't been asked yet, but I think it's important to sort of clarify. We've been doing some equity work at Dr. Cog just ourselves as an agency, both organizationally, but also um, defining sort of an equity tool, equity work that we presented on actually here at our September, August meeting uh, that we talked about our equity work. And we spent a lot of time thinking through, okay, how do we define these communities, these neighborhoods? Is it characteristic of community? Is it geography? How do we do that? At the end of the day, we actually punted a little bit and said, um, for you jurisdictions that are interested in submitting, you define for us your communities of need, your communities of interest, um, and that's how we're going to work through it. You all know your communities best, and that's sort of the that's sort of the way that we're going to work with you all for those communities that are selected, those jurisdictions that are selected to work with those communities. Bill, I was just going to echo Deborah's comments. We took the same approach for the uh, system-wide fair study and equity analysis that we've identified. We're working with six CBOs, and it took a lot of hand-holding at the beginning to get them on board and to have them understand things like how they have to deal with federal funding and other things like that. So it's really important that you do a lot of work up front to work with them. But it's been a hugely valuable process. I, would, I, I applaud you guys for doing it, though. Thank you. I appreciate that. Comments or questions? Let's move on to um, number seven. Yes, item number seven: transportation planning framework and tech committee guidelines. Jacob, you're taking this. Yes. Yes. Um, along with my colleague Matthew Helfant. 
Um, so on this one, this is a couple related things, um, and these were in your packet. One is the document that used to be known as the transportation planning in the Denver region document. Uh, we're now calling it the transportation planning framework. We've been working over the last several months in partnership with CDOT and RTD to kind of update and revise this document. Um, so we want to present it to you today just informationally so that, um, so that you have a sense of what it is. Um, really plain English, just to give it away. Plain English, Transportation 101. How does transportation planning work in this region? Who does it? How do they work together? What does it mean? What are the products? So it's really meant to be a resource um, both for you all, all of us as stakeholders, but even for the general public and for our board and other elected officials. So Matthew is going to give a very short presentation to just kind of talk through the framework document. And then related to that is our Transportation Advisory Committee guidelines, which are covered within the framework document. You may recall back um, in July, I believe, we had an initial conversation around some potential ideas of updating and revising our TAC committee guidelines. Uh, we've now put some specific proposals in front of you that I'm going to walk you through once Matthew's done. So Matthew, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, now we got it. All right, so uh, the framework is a document that uh, we was recently renamed, uh, formerly known as the Prospectus or uh, Planning in the Denver Region. Most of you probably familiar with it. What it really is is a, a document that describes how uh, RTD, Dr. Cog, and CDOT work together uh, for tr regional transportation planning in the Denver Region. Next slide. So the purpose is to, to um, uh, describe uh, policies and procedures, uh, detail how Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD cooperate, um, identify key regional uh, transportation planning project, pr products, um, show how the regional planning process uh, dovetails with uh, in individual processes of each of the three partners, local governments, air quality, conformity, et cetera. And um, it's also, uh, since the last cycle, uh, been referenced in the uh, Memorandum of Understanding uh, between Dr. Cog, RTD, and CDOT on um, how we, how we uh, work together to plan, to re plan a, a transportation in this region. Next slide. So um, just some elements of it, uh, policy direction, uh, Dr. Cog committees, stakeholder and public engagement, uh, planning process products, and uh, coordination with other transportation processes, and you see a list there. Next slide. So uh, just some highlights of new topics uh, that, that have come up this time around. Uh, uh, the greenhouse gas planning standard obviously is brand new. Uh, Senate Bill 21260, uh, the Front Range Passenger Rail District, and of course, our latest surface transportation uh, authorization bill. Next slide. And I'll take some questions. Have any questions? Yeah, and Mr. Chair, before questions, I just want to say a couple things. The other thing we've done, it's been about since 2016 since we've updated this document. So a big part of the work was just sort of updating the, the narrative and the content of the document. Uh, we've also done a redesign of the document. And I do want to publicly thank Matthew, Alvin Bidal Sanchez, and our communications and marketing team for their work on the transportation planning framework. Any questions? Direct. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, Jacob, and Matthew. Um, is it fair to comment on the the membership? Uh, I'm going to present that next, so let's let's do that in the second half of this. And I'll let's talk through it. Hold my comment. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to the next informational. Oh, oh sorry. All right, this, we need part two still. Yeah. Jump the gun. <laughs> no worries. We have to get to Rick's question. Yes, sir. Haley, Haley, if you could, could you bring up the, um, the item for just the, the actual packet item and have that on the screen? Thank you so much. 
While Kaylee's doing that, let me um, sort of tee this up. Um, as I said, we had an initial conversation with you a few months ago just to start talking through this, but we've been kind of thoughtfully working through with staff our, our Dr. Cog committee guidelines, which cover all of our committees um, at Dr. Cog. Obviously, today we're going to talk about um, the Transportation Advisory Committee uh, guidelines. So what's in your packet that Kaylee's pulling up is actually track changes. We have some specific proposals that we want to talk through with you and get your input on today. This is an info item this month, and then in December, uh, we'll bring it back to you as an action item, but we wanted to tee up kind of these ideas. Um, thematically, I think there's three big things that we want to talk about. One is expanding the local government membership um, of TAC to have more local government members. The second is the role of the sub-regional transportation forums, the county transportation forums, in terms of um, uh, uh, recommending of um, naming and recommending approval of the local government members to um, TAC which today is done by the board chair. And then the third thematic thing that we want to talk about is the uh, special interest seats that we have on TAC. So, Kaylee, if we could trouble you one more time, if you could make that larger for folks. Thank you so much. So let me go ahead and get started. We'll just kind of go through this together. These are track changes, so we'll just kind of take this um, a section at, the time, at a time. So Kaylee's showing the beginning of this, which is the membership. So the first thing here, the first edit that you see is right now, low, uh, most urban counties um, on TAC, most urban counties within our region um, have two members um, on TAC. We are proposing to expand that to three members. So that would be for our urban MPO counties, as well as the city and county of Denver. So before we go any farther, let me just stop there and get some reaction to that. Curious, uh, what's the thinking um, for the and I'm basically um, asking about only one representative for Broomfield. What was the thinking behind? That? Um, no fight against Broomfield, and we can certainly talk about whether Broomfield should have two. But the general idea here was that it's you know it's different in MPOs across the country. And we did some research on what other what other MPOs do. We have such a large region; we have 56 local governments. We can't have every single one be part of TAC. This committee would be too big. But you know we've had sort of this stable number of members for many many years, and we thought it would be a good idea to just a little bit expand kind of the universe of local government membership on TAC. You are our stakeholders. We want to be as reasonably inclusive as we can. So the idea was just to sort of up the local government membership a little bit. Um, I don't want to answer that one. Um, I, this is definitely something we can talk about. It's, it's, you know, we're trying to just think about population. There's no, you know, sort of specific quantitative formulas, but just sort of population Broomfield versus the other counties. Appreciate it. Brent? So if we expand it, does that mean now we have three alternatives or alternates to the committee for each one of those representatives? It would theoretically mean that each member would have an alternate, yes. Or would we want to consider a alternate at large that could represent any one of the three that aren't? We could talk about that. In fact, as we get further down here um, in the committee guidelines, there's a section about alternates, and I want to talk about alternates. So I think that could be an interesting idea as well. Okay, ready to move on? I got a question. Oh. Thanks. Um, just generally speaking, because there's a lot of changes here, is there a way to frame the motive, like what motivated us at a high level to make these changes before we get into just because of how other MPOs do it, or is there more here that we should know about before we go through them? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so let me step back. I told you there were three thematic changes. One was to increase the local government membership on TAC, so we just talked about that. The second is that currently the Dr. Cog board chair directly approves the local government members of TAC, um, and that's a little bit unusual, and we've had great board chairs. That process has worked well uh, for many, many years, but it is a little bit unusual. Um, and at the time that that was set up, and for many years after that was set up, we didn't have the county transportation forums. Now we do. And in fact, whenever there's a vacancy at the local government level, as many of you know, I will come to you and I will come to your county and to your forum and ask you all to give me a consensus recommendation through your forum that I take to the Dr. Cog board chair. So a little bit of thoughtfulness from our from our end as well, should the forums 
have that responsibility directly um, to approve the local government membership. So that's kind of the thematic idea there. And then the third thing I identified was our special in special interest seats on TAC. Right now we have seven special interest seats. So our thought there as staff is, you know, are those the right seats? Or is that the right number of seats? Should we have more? Should we have different? And should some of those seats be appointed a little bit differently? Some of them, um, some they're not universally situated in terms of sort of their universe of, of potential um, applicants or representative. And so we'll talk about that when we get there. But that's kind of thematically where we're at. Justin, does that answer your question? Yeah, and I guess I'm just wondering functionally, if we're just documenting some things the way they currently happen, but maybe the guidelines don't reflect that. I was just curious about the, the board chair piece versus coming from the forums. If it no, this would be a change. This would be a change. And on all three of these actually would be a change. Okay. I guess I'm looking forward to hearing more about it as you go. Okay. Keep going. All right. So on this same. Okay. Um, so on the same section, one thing that we crossed out, actually, sorry, Kaylee, if you go back up just a little bit. All right, so on this first paragraph, I crossed out um, the section that begins with at least three appointed from county government and so on. I'm not going to read all that to you, but the idea here is that many years ago, we set this up, and it's pretty, it's important, but honestly, it's convoluted. That's Jacob's, um, just so Ron doesn't kick me under the table. Jacob said it was convoluted. It is important, it was important, that we wanted to make sure that there was some fair representation between local governments, county governments, um, small communities. Um, so the section that I've crossed out there actually talks about how many come from, you know, from cities versus counties um, versus small communities, 35,000 or under. Um, so thematically here, if we trust our forums, if we like that idea, and that will come in the next section, or even if we don't, have we evolved as a region to the point where we trust ourselves and trust each other, that we don't need to have sort of, well, it has to be part of this and some of this and not more than that and something of something else. Can we simplify that a little bit um, in terms of the types of local government representatives that we have? on TAC. So that's really what that crossed out section is about. Are there questions on that? Okay. All right. So going down, uh, we talked about, um, let's see, we talked about the three members sitting in county uh, of Denver as well. Um, again, Sarah for Broomfield, if you feel strongly, it should be two instead of one. Um, that's a change we'd love to discuss and, and sort of have a conversation around. Let's put you on the spot. <laughs> Um, the next one is um, the reference to representing Clear Creek and Gilpin counties. So we have a seat that's dedicated to our non-MPO area of the Dr. Cog region. The Dr. Cog region is more than our MPO area. The non-MPO areas of Dr. Cog are Clear Creek and Gilpin counties and Adams and Arapahoe east of Kiowa Creek. Um, generally, the non-MPO seat, at least as long as I've been doing this, which is almost a decade, has been represented by someone from either Clear Creek or Gilpin counties. Um, generally, the, uh, the small community and Adams and Arapaho are represented through those counties. So really the clarification there is just that the non-MPO seat uh, represents Clear Creek and, and Gilpin counties. So that's what that potential clarification change would be. Um, going down a little bit, some of this is just sort of cleanup, um, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, let's get down to the special interest seats. Kaylee, if you'll scroll towards the end of this page. Down just a little bit. Yep, there we go. Stop there. Thank you so much. So we currently, as I said, have spe seven special interest seat representatives on TAC. These are subject matter experts in areas relating to transportation that are important uh, for our transportation planning work and important for our committee's work. So we are proposing um, adding one or two here. Um, so having some new um, special interest seat representatives. And we're proposing um, that a couple of these actually just be standing members. So let me give you an example of each of those. Um, currently, we have a representative from Denver International Airport. Um, and whenever that seat has become vacant, there is really a small pool. There's like just a handful of folks that can represent aviation interests um, on, on TAC. So we don't typically do a competitive application process to fill the aviation seat. We talk to the two or three people that could represent that seat. So we're suggesting the proposal here is that is an example of a special interest seat. Look, why don't we just make it a member of Denver International Airport? 
airport has a standing committee seat on TAC. So that's one example there. The example in terms of changing the special interest seats, we currently have a shared seat between transportation demand management and non-motorized transportation. We rotate that every two years. We said to ourselves as staff, look, those are both important. Why don't we make each of those a seat and have a representative for each of those? By the same token, uh, let's have a conversation around should we have a seat of, of someone representing equity uh, or vulnerable populations? Uh, what about housing in some form? Um, recently in the bipartisan infrastructure law, there's been strength in language, and we made unified, unified planning work program amendments regarding the relationship between housing and transportation. Should we have a housing special interest seat? Um, so those are examples. I want to have some conversation here, but um, that's what's intended in this section. So let me stop there and take questions and conversation. Maybe with numbers of people, if you added these seats. Yeah, it would be roughly, I think I calculated around 10 more members of TAC, give or take. Total. It's 16, 25 ish, give or take. So yeah, it would make this committee a little larger for sure. Larger isn't necessarily a of voice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jacob, um, I appreciate the refresh and the thinking about, okay, things have changed, so let's let's see what we should change uh, for this committee. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, and I'm sticking my nose in where it probably doesn't belong, uh, aviation. Um, it seems two things. It seems that there are a couple of other aviation interests in the region, especially the regional airports that are becoming more and more um, important. Uh, so I'm wondering how uh, concentrating at, at DIA or DEN is going to help that or reduce that. Also related, uh, you know, I, I tend to look forward to the future, even if I might not see it. Um, and uh, interesting, a couple articles in uh, the Journal and the New York Times over the last couple of weeks about traveling in urban areas by air. So I, I don't know that maybe an airport might have a pretty focused view of things and maybe not be open to those sorts of challenges, which I think the urban areas are going to have to deal with. So, and I've got a couple of others. Okay, let me address the aviation seat first because it's a good question. In the last three years or so, we've had three different, um, or technically four different aviation representatives. We've had Denver International Airport, uh, we've had Centennial Airport, and we've had the Division of Aeronautics at CDOT. Um, that represented David U. Lane um, on this committee. Just sort of some of the feedback we've gotten is that um, it, it's a little hard for some of those folks to just sort of participate continually. We, we certainly work on aviation here, but it's not as much of a bread and butter issue as like transit or some of the other things that we all work on together. And so aviation as a seat on TAC, absolutely important, but we've kind of had our most consistent, I mean, all those representatives have been great, but we've had our most consistent representation through Denver International Airport um, they're vitally important to the Dr. Cog region, so the thought is, should they just be a standing scene? Maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't, so it's up for discussion, but that was the thinking. Okay. Um, my second one, it kind of, <laughs> Frank, I, I don't know if I'm stealing a question that you might have, or maybe you've already covered this, that, you know, changing from a non-RTD representative of transit interest to VIA, is that a at an acceptable move? I'd, I'd be interested in Frank's comments. Well, uh, I feel a little bit awkward because obviously, you know, it's not represented here, but uh, I do think that, uh, you know, kind of to the point Deborah made in terms of enlarging, having the representation is really what's kind of most important. It, uh, less uh, specific as to whether it's got to be via or, you know, just on RTD transit related. But certainly we appreciate the fact that we've been 
you know, since 2020, our focus has grown into the metro area quite a bit. And we took over the work that had previously been done by Seniors Resource Center, and that made via mobility services, you know, a fairly large presence in the eight nine county area, and certainly in in the Dr. Cog jurisdiction. So I think it makes sense. But again, I, it's I'm not sure everyone would agree with that, and that's why I'm kind of hedging my bets here a little bit. You know, if others might disagree with that, I I would certainly leave room for that. Um, Eight. Mr. Chair, Jacob Frank, um, I agree. I, I like the focus that that uh, an organization like yours brings, and there's an identity that goes with that. So I think that's a positive move. Yeah, and I think just the rationale and the special interest seats is, you know, when I said that they're not universally situated or uniformly situated, really the the idea here, the way we think of, of it as staff is that when we have a special interest seat vacan vacancy, we will try to do a competitive application. That's a practice that Ron instituted when he came. I think it's a very good practice. You know, let's try and encourage some applications. Let's get some interest in those seats. So we thought to ourselves, many of these seats, we can do that, like a freight seat. If the freight seat becomes empty, there's several, we have two class one railroads, trunking companies, right? We can do that. Some of these other seats like non-RTD transit where VIA is the dominant provider, like aviation where DEN is the dominant provider in this region, does it make as much sense? So for us, that was a little bit of the litmus test. If we could do a competitive application for that seat, then we, you know, we should probably do that. If we can't, because there really is just that one provider that seems to make sense, should we just give them a buy right seat on TAC? So that was kind of the logic. Appreciate that. I have one last one, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, and, and this is um, thinking back to Mobility Choice Blueprint, and one of the elements of that was to encourage uh, private sector participation in something maybe called Mobility Next, which that's that's essentially evaporated. I think the struggle through the pandemic, two and a half years. Uh, was difficult. Uh, what's been a success is the AMP. And I think that's a marvelous uh, initiative that's making some great progress. Um, I do think that the private sector has needs a voice at some point. Maybe it's premature. Maybe there are other places where that voice could be heard. Um, but I, you know, as, as things come back to the new normal, uh, I, I, just, I just think trip making is going to be very diverse. It's not going to be what ITE thinks it is in their in their manual. That's a that could be a doorstop now. Um, I, I think that the private sector is going to try to fill part of that vacuum. It would be well, perhaps it's premature, but it would, would be a good idea to start seeing where private sector providers. Uh, have a role in conversations here or elsewhere. Policy development. No, I think that's fair, and I appreciate that very much. Do you have a question? Um, a comment following up on the um, discussion of RTD service provider representation. Um, on the TAC, I'm going to forward a proposal that was made by Alex Hyde Wright, who I'm the alternate for today with Tony. Um, he is proposing that we add to this interest um, special interest list a um, transit advocate, not necessarily um, a service provider, and might not necessarily be someone a specific transit advocacy group. Since light on those in the region. Um, but I think what he's getting at is along the lines of the non-motorized transportation interest group, um, someone who's more on the demand side or the user side as opposed to the provider side. So I would just like to offer that on his behalf. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you, Gene. Brian? So when we were talking about Dan and the aviation component, throw this out. Should that be one of Denver's three allocated folks for the sub-region, potentially, or representing? Granted, it's a different part, but it's part of the city. Uh, 
Let me clear my throat. Look at it. Is this on? Okay. Um, would that be the only requirement of any of the subregions? If everybody gets three, but Denver has one of its prescribed four, or is there another situation like that? I'm just curious. There wouldn't be another situation like that. So. Or if, if I can just pose the broader question, I think Ryan might be getting um, is really some feedback from the group about this issue of and sort of being assigned the agent sort of seat to represent a people versus rotating among because th there are other um, airport regional airports and and general aviation airports around the region and are important to the transportation system. Um, more than others, for certain. Um, we're not we're not wed to this proposal. We're just trying to reflect the need that they, reflect the fact that they are sort of the dominant major in the region. I won't answer Brian's question, but I but I would like feedback. We would appreciate feedback from this group about you know is the sense of this committee um, that. Aviation ought to continue to just be a general aviation seat, and we'll continue to work to rotate that around among uh, folks, recognizing that it has been a little challenging to get some consistent representation um, broad um, kind of. Aviation. But if that's the will of the committee, uh, we don't have big heartburn with retaining it the way. Let me go ahead first. Oh, I'm sorry, Lisa, sorry. Hi, um, Lisa Wynn with Denver International Airport. Um, I'm the alternate for George Holocove. Um, frankly, we could have it either way. Um, we at DEN do communicate regularly and often with all of our local and regional airports. So from aeronautics division and aeronautical standpoint, I don't see that necessarily being um, much of a challenge in being in the loop with the other airports. I think, frankly, uh, maybe it's a staffing bandwidth for some of the other um, smaller and local airports. So even when there's been, um, you know, a non-DEN uh, individual who's been at that seat, usually someone from DEN does um, attend the TAC meetings. Um, for what it's worth, DEN does have a big commitment towards mobility and transportation, um, so much so that they do have their own mobility staff member and potentially will be looking at a department. They're developing their own mobility plans. So um, they're very much invested in being part of the Hiller, I think you had your hand up. Away from that, I wanted to um, talk again about. I know that this proposal would give us more seats already. Um, so I did, you know, I guess, equity vulnerability. Is that one seat? Or there. I'd love to have more. I want to make sure that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the idea there, and again, these, some of these are just ideas for discussion, right? We just want to put something in front of you and get your feedback. But the idea behind an equity seat or a vulnerable population seat, it would be one seat. Um, so you know, what's the right term for it? But it would be one seat, uh, kind of you know, specifically representing those voices um, on TAC. At Dr. Cog, when we've done our regional transportation plan work, uh, we've had a civic advisory group um, that was formed specifically to represent those vulnerable populations throughout the region. Um, though it was a small group, it was really important um, to our planning process, and we're now looking at um, potentially keeping that group on and scaling them up to be more of an agency-wide group to get involved in our other planning processes. So it's really the thought on that seat is more just how can we better institutionalize equity within our transportation planning work. Rick? Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Jacob. Um, so I finally just paid attention to that. Um, I think that there there could be uh, a, a chance in the future that the equity question related to vulnerable populations takes over that that seat, and the special interests uh, would would take a 
Secondary, secondary seat, seat, a back seat, maybe. Um, I, I think the the senior interest is uh, it's very important, um, and coupled with uh, the the aging res the, the responsibilities that Dr. Cog has for uh, the aging population, which I am that. Uh, I, you, <laughs> and there's about 30% of the population, or no, I don't know, that's too many. 20, uh, there's a lot of us. Um, and so I, I you know, I'm, I, uh, Hillary, I don't know that you were that direct about the fact that the seat would go away, but it, it could be um, put, put back in an emphasis role uh, if if we were to move away from that. I agree that an equity and vulnerable populations interest is there, uh, especially given the uh, IIJA foundation and the movement uh, that we're seeing uh, going forward there. So I, I would argue for uh, an additional seat to represent that interest. Yeah, and I realize now, um, Hillary, I should have answered your question a little bit better than I did. I realize now what you were getting at. Um, it was a thought process on staff that older adults are definitely one potential aspect of equity, just the, the umbrella term of equity. So the idea here is, you know, do we sort of transform your current seat into a broader equity seat? Or as Rick suggests, is there a potential that older adults, just that group and all that we do with that group and you all do, you know, should, is that worth its own seat, so to speak? I hate to put it that way. Um, but it, you know, should we have a seat dedicated to older adults, and then maybe a second, a second seat or a separate seat uh, for other equity populations? So again, these are just proposals. We just wanted to get things out in front of you for your consideration. I appreciate the dialogue on this. Go ahead, Hillary. Thank you. Um, I would also like to see that being two seats so we get more of those voices um, because, you know, especially as our society is aging and is a really important piece of the transportation puzzle here, um, that, that that voice is not lost, um, but that we are elevating more equitable voices. And to hear um, more about the uh, civic advisory group, you know, maybe that's a seat. Somebody from that group is, is on this committee as well. Um, and rather than, I'm not just fighting for my own seat, I don't, I don't mind who this is, but I want to make sure that older adults' interests are, you know, are still um, at the forefront of the table. Um, and I would, I would more propose uh, renaming seniors than, uh, than getting rid of it altogether. Um, but I do think if we, if we bring uh, VM Mobility on as a specific seat, we will have some of that voice too. So, um, you know, that's something to think about, but I, I do want to make sure we don't uh, lose that. Thank you. I appreciate you. that. Thank you. Um, unless there's other questions, I don't want to truncate the conversation. I do. We still have one more big thematic thing to get through. Um, are there any other questions on the special interest seats, or can we move on to appointments? Okay. Kaylee, if you wouldn't mind, yeah, if you could go to the top of the next page. Pull down just a little bit more. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Um, so this next section, um, I've written this to sort of be consistent with the format of the committee guidelines, so this doesn't look quite as bad as it looks with all the virtual red ink. The idea here is it's taking that paragraph that's crossed out and it's restating it more kind of in the just format of the committee guidelines, but to create an intentional section around appointment and selection of members to TAC. But again, the big thematic idea here is that, again, currently the Dr. Cog board chair directly appoints all the local government government members to TAC. You all don't do that. The board chair does that. He does that based on staff recommendation. We in turn get that staff recommendation from working with all of you anytime there's a local government vacancy and asking you now through your forums to recommend a consistent candidate or a consensus candidate, not a consistent. Uh, we do want consistent people on TAC, but we also want consensus people on TAC, a consensus recommendation that I can take to our board chair to fill a seat whenever there's a local government vacancy. So part of this is just kind of more more specifically spelling that out. But the big change here would be, instead of the Dr. Cog board chair directly making the local government appointments, it would be the forums in the eight urban MPO counties, for those of you that do have um, sub-regional transportation forums, that the forums um, directly would appoint uh, the members. So that's the proposal on the table for this part of the, uh, of the committee guidelines. So let me stop there for questions and conversation on that. Deborah. I really like the idea of the forums selecting the members. It provides for consistency. It provides for local control. I think there's a lot of good training.
Does anyone oppose that idea or have heartburn with that idea? Was that a thumbs up that you like the idea or that you oppose it? Okay. <laughs> I want to make sure. <laughs> Okay. Um, and then the next thing in this section is to clarify the non-MPO areas, which again, primarily Clear Creek and Gilpin counties. Um, today, the process is when we have a vacancy, I work with staff in those counties. This kind of formalizes that of working through the county managers to get a consensus and a consistent candidate um, in Clear Creek and Gilpin counties to represent the non-MPO scene. And then for the special interest seats right now, every year we do an annual review. I do an annual review with um, our Dr. Cog board chair. We kind of just talk about TAC. We go through the membership. We fill any vacancies. And then we take to the Regional Transportation Committee. We actually have the RTC approve each year uh, the special interest seats. So those of you that are special interest seat members know that I reach out to you once a year. I ask you, you know, do you still want to represent your seat? And then RTC will actually confirm or reconfirm the existing special interest seat representatives and fill any vacancies. So this would spell out that the special interest seats would be nominated by the Dr. Cog board chair, as is done now, and approved by the Dr. Cog Regional Transportation Committee for two-year terms, so to make that a little bit more specific and formal, and that the Dr. Cog board chair and RTC shall review TAC membership annually in the second quarter of each year, which is essentially what we do now. We don't want to lose that link. We want to make sure there's that connection between the newly elected Dr. Cog board chair each year and the TAC and the great work that you all do here. So that's really what this section is. Questions or comments on that? Okay. Um, Kaylee, if you could, sorry, one more time. Thank you so much. If you could scroll down to the alternate section, this one I think is a little bit easier. Currently today, um, once you are um, appointed a member of Dr. Cog, currently today, of course, by the board chair, you as members, local government members, and actually all members, um, are directly responsible for your alternates. You appoint your own alternate. So the idea here would be, um, first of all, just sort of cleaning up uh, sort of the communication around submitting um, name of the designated alternate. You all do that to me, so that's formalizing that. But for discussion, what's in highlight is should the sub-regional transportation forums, if you like the idea that they would appoint members, do you like the idea that they would also appoint alternates, or should the members continue to directly appoint their alternates? So I'd like some feedback on that, please. Barbara. Barbara, why do you go first? <laughs> so I think it's a good idea to have the forum because of estimate be some of those alternates will actually become delegates because it makes it that change. Ryan, go ahead. I concur. That's where I was going as well. Right. No, for TAC. That is, that is more consistent with the RTC practice where each agency that has a number of seats available on RTC appoints the members and the slate of alternates. And when a designated member is not available to attend RTC, one of the alternates attends RTC in their stead. So I mean, personally, I think um, Max concurrence, this makes some sense. If the forums are appointing the members, the forums can appoint the slate of members and available alternates. We'll ask the members to, from each uh, coordinate for TAC meetings if one of the members isn't available to make sure an alternate is. Okay. Um, one last thing, Kaylee, if you could scroll to the very end. Very last thing, and this gets to Deborah's question. Okay, it'll be the quorum and voting section. Yep, right there, that's the end. So currently, the way the committee is configured today, it's 15 members, uh, voting members is a quorum. Obviously, that would change, and if we did everything we're contemplating, again, I think it would be about 10 additional members, but just an acknowledgement here that whatever changes we end up recommending um, to these committee guidelines will change our quorum uh, for voting, so we'll fill that in once we know what, what the kind of denominator is. So, oh. Uh, thank you. That seems sound like a good uh, point to bring this up. Um, I was wondering about the requirement for uh, in-person voting only. 
um, of this committee, and particularly as the committee is growing and would have a higher quorum number, um, if it's the stated purpose to reduce the number of alternates, um, not requiring in-person voting would be beneficial, and of course, um, reducing the amount of trips many people are taking is what many of us work on. Yeah, thank you. I'll address that. Uh, it is, it is um, our belief that it's important for a committee that meets once a month that does really important regional transportation work and policy deliberations that when it's safe to do so, that we meet in person and that those people that are here and participating in the discussion face to face with each other have the opportunity to provide votes. Uh, it gets much more challenging to have a hybrid meeting just functionally, to have people adequately participate remotely and in person. And we believe to get to really good decision making. So we think if, if, if you want to serve on this committee and commit to being part of this process through serving as a member on this committee, we're asking you once a month to make a commitment to come down here and participate. I think I, I appreciate that viewpoint. Is that something we could consider changing or is that a directive and we can't? Your Dr. Cox staff opposes that. Thank you. That didn't quite answer my question. Is it an option to allow virtual voting? Can I put that forward as a motion? I'm kind of new here, so so I'm not sure of quite the process all the time. Again, I think we've got some we've got some technical and functional um, and relational issues around this table to have have a mix of people participating remotely and in person have voting happen um, remotely. So, no. um, so th that is not an option for us to uh, um, put into quorum requirements that um, members can participate virtually. Members and alternates can can log on to the meeting and monitor the meeting virtually and listen into the meeting. We're saying not voting virtual. Go ahead, Art. Um, regarding the alternates earlier, and we kind of off of that. I didn't know. Like, a slate of alternates that could fill in for one of the missing of a person for <laughs> We're so excited to answer that question. Um, yeah, no, we um, appreciated Brian then mentioning that earlier and you reminding us, Art. I think that's a proposal on the table. Um, what I'm going to suggest, I didn't want to truncate it if there were any more questions, but I do want to thank you all for this very thoughtful discussion and questions. What I'm going to suggest is take the rest of this week to kind of look through this. I think we got some pretty clear direction and we really appreciate it. But take the rest of the week, look through this, email me if you have any more specific comments, questions, proposals. And what we'll do in December is we'll bring back a revised version, marked up version like this uh, for your action at that time. Um, so one question again, sorry, on process. If we'd like to put forward a proposal as a member, we should email that to you? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I think we're done with that item. Uh, why don't we move on to item number eight, informational item on the U.S. Department of Transportation discretionary grant application. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so um, you'll recall that with um, all of the discretionary grant programs coming out of the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, also known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA, um, just as an uh, out of an abundance of transparency and communication with each other, when those major grant um, NOFOs, notices of funding opportunity have been released, we've been sending out information to our local government members and partners um, about those opportunities, as well as asking for submission of some basic information if one of you is considering applying for one of those grant applications, uh, just so that we're all aware of what's happening, right? It's not, not a, not a 
matter, matter of approving or saying yes or no, you can or can't apply for that grant opportunity, really just as an opportunity for us as a region together to um, know what's happening with other jurisdictions, identify and pursue opportunities to partner. So if one jurisdiction is uh, considering submitting a grant application for one of these grant programs, then other jurisdictions around the region go, hey, I, I could be a partner in that. Are you interested in working together? Should we do, should we do something together? Um, it also helps us as an agency because we often get asked to provide support letters for those grant applications. And uh, on, on a, uh, an interest in being transparent with all of you, we felt it was important for all of you to know what we might be providing letters of support for, uh, so that we're sort of not getting asked on the side, hey, can you give us a, a letter of support for this project or for that project? So that's all this is. Uh, the three programs that were um, out when we sent this last uh, request out to all of you were for the Reconnecting Communities grant program. That's one of the new programs that created in. Um, the Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Transportation or SMART program that's really about transportation technology sort of initiatives and the Advanced Transportation Technologies and Innovation ATTAIN uh, program. Uh, some parallels to SMART but under Congress's immense wisdom, two separate grant programs. I don't know. Um, at any rate, those were the three. We asked uh, for submissions of a pretty basic form. We one from the city and county of Denver for the Reconnecting Communities program. So we've included those forms in your packet for you. And we had uh, four submittals uh, from jurisdictions for the SMART program. Um, Thornton for uh, uh, advanced traffic signal, uh, cars measures on Washington Street and 84th. Uh, Dr. Cog actually is working with some partners to uh, put in an application under SMART for a Ride Alliance Human Service Transfer exchange to assist our uh, regional kind of uh, uh, service transportation providers connect rides together. Uh, City of Aurora, a smart city signal technology uh, project on Chambers and Colfax corridors, and then CDOT and I-25 adapted ramp signals uh, system on the south part of I-25 south of downtown. Um, the reconnecting communities for city and county of Denver, sorry, I skipped over that. That's mainly, I believe, a, a, a transit stop and accessibility access improvement project uh, for those. Um, that application was actually due already, so I believe that one went in um, uh, earlier in October. Uh, SMART project applications are due this month, so they'll be submitted here. So with that, just wanted to provide that overview. If you have questions of each other on those projects, I'll defer to the to the sponsoring agency. Just quick clarification on our I-25 um, smart application, we actually are looking at going north of downtown as well, up to 144th Avenue. That one? Next item is an informational item. There's no presentation on that one. It's just for your information. We'll move on to administrative items. Uh, it's, sorry, just to clarify on the um, um, on this item, the regional transportation operations and technology item, uh, we will bring it to you in December. We wanted to include it in the packet today. Um, so you have the information, but we'll talk to you about it in December. All right, so under member comments and other matters, does anyone have any member comments? We, uh, Carson, I think has an up, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, Carson's gonna go now. All right, go ahead with your amp update. I'm ready. Um, uh, the Advanced Mobility Partnership update working group, I, I'm the representative, Rick brought it up earlier to that kind of working group. Uh, just to bring us back to center on that point, I give an update every month, but that's kind of the reminder of why I speak at the end of every meeting. Um, we met earlier this month and had a handful of informational briefings, first from Seattle DOT regarding their current management strategies and some best practices there. We heard from CDOT's team around their Office of Innovative Mobility um, round of grants focused around TDM and electrification that are kind of coming out here soon. And finally, we heard an update from RGD about the latest in their reimagined process. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. 
So the other, the last item, I kind of created this item myself and it surprised these folks with this. I am leaving Jefferson County, and so apparently there's never been a change of this sort of the chair. I'm going to work with uh, Mac and his gang over there at the uh, city of Aurora. I'm going to be uh, the uh, deputy, one of two deputy uh, public works directors there. So that'll be my future. But that means I will be stepping down from the TAC. This will be my last TAC meeting, sadly. Uh, but I miss, I'll miss working with you all. Uh, I really appreciate everything that you do for the region. It's been one of the greatest honors of my career to work here and to be the chair here. Uh, I particularly want to say uh, that the people who taught me the most about regional planning in my younger years when I was in an Adams County community were the pair of Jeans, Gene Shreve and Gene Putman. Um, they were wonderful and taught me so much. And also Dave Baskett, Deborah's husband, is, uh, was really a great uh, I me mean, in my time at Sheriff's. Thank you all for, uh, I've been here for eight years and it's uh, been Great honor for me. Thank you. Uh, but the, uh, <laughs> and so that does bring an administrative challenge, though. So uh, before I, before we have uh, Jacob deal with the board of the administrative issues, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Steve. Uh, you've been an institution around this table since I joined Dr. Cog almost five years ago. And you were one of the first people I met early on when I first started at CDOT. Um, eight years ago uh, upon moving here from Oregon um, and always appreciated the fine breakfast provided at the Jefferson <laughs> County meetings um, that, that set the bar high uh, for those coordination meetings, um, but just have always appreciated your engagement, your partnership, your willingness to collaborate around all these tables and especially the TAC table and have thoroughly enjoyed having you uh, be chair of TAC and sorry that that tenure has been truncated, but super happy for your your new opportunity and congratulations. Um, on. Yeah, well said, Ron. And let me add my my thanks to you as well, Steve. One of the institutions of transportation planning in this region, we're going to miss you in this role, but hopefully still be able to work with you in your new role. However, uh, that does create a challenge for this committee. Um, we elect our committee officers, our TAC officers, every two years. So we did that last December. Um, Steve's tenure as chair goes for another year. Um, since he is leaving, we do need to elect a new chair. Um, and potentially, if the vice chair uh, position, which is Sarah, if she runs for chair, then we'd also need to elect a vice chair. So what we would like to do to follow our process is uh, I'd like to form a nominating panel, which is typically three, four, five folks that over the next month or so, we would try and solicit uh, some candidates to run for at least chair and, and vice chair if that's needed. Uh, reach out to some folks as needed. Uh, we'll solicit candidates from all of you directly, uh, but the nominating panel helps do that. And then depending on the number of candidates that we get, the nominating panel kind of helps work through those and potentially recommend um, a slate of um, a chair and maybe vice chair candidates that we would have elections at the December meeting. So don't want to put people on the spot. If you're willing to volunteer right now in a nominating panel, I'd certainly welcome that. Uh, we will send out a reminder after this meeting, um, but whether you do it right now or reach out to me in the next couple days, really would appreciate help from a couple folks. And then we will also send out a solicitation asking you all to, um, to consider running for chair um, and then again, potentially vice chair. And again, we would have those elections at our December meeting. That term would be for the remainder, as I said, um, of the current officer's term, which is through uh, December of 2023. It's a two-year term of which we're halfway through. Jacob, I'm willing to help on the nominating panel. If we are to move forward with the recommendation for people on that go into as currently envisioned, so it's a good question. I don't want to overcomplicate it, but just to give you a little bit of context, while we're focusing on TAC uh, committee guidelines as a staff, we're looking at all of our, or several of our committee guidelines in kind of a coordinated effort because ultimately, whatever changes we make to our committee guidelines at Dr. Cog, we would need to amend our articles of association. So I don't know if our executive director is in the room, but the last schedule I heard is that potentially we would bring those to the board um, at their January meeting. So theoretically, I guess those changes might take effect at January TAC potentially. I have it on good authority. Let's 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 plan for the first quarter of 2023. Sometime in that first quarter of 2023. Mike comments at least say there'd be a bigger
Pat. I'm just happy to help you. <laughs> <on the panel. laughs> So uh, I think that is all we have for um, member comments. Um, our next meeting, I won't be here, but your next meeting will be December 19th, 2022. But I'm going to keep an eye on it, y'all. Don't worry about that. That's right. So with that, our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>